Okay, Coach Smart is ready for your questions. Where's the micro? First one right here, Coach, to your left. Sorry, Richard Johnson, SEC Network. Uh, Coach, you had some interesting comments to the Texas high school coaches about work-life balance and trying to find the, the, the middle road there. What were your conversations with Matt Luke about that uh, before he left coaching? Well, I tried to convince him to stay. <laughs> you know, uh, there were heartfelt conversations that probably need to stay between Matt and I, but he, he loves the game of football. The game of football has blessed he and his family tremendously. He'd be the first to tell you that. Um, he is a family man. And um, the sacrifices that coaches make today, and look, I'm not whining and complaining. Don't think that I'm upset. I love my profession. I love what I do, and I do it every day all over again, being a high school coach if I could, because I love the profession. But it's tough on the time demands. And, um, you know, he, I think he felt like there was some purity lost in the game because guys were playing not necessarily for the education or for each other, or, or they were playing, you know, for the, the, the NIL opportunity or maybe for the NFL. And uh, it's tough sometimes as a coach uh, when you, you find that and you're like, well, I'm away from my kids and I don't get an opportunity to be at their baseball games and grow and do the things they need to do. And he was very appreciative of the opportunity, the time spent. His family still lives in Athens. And I actually just had part of my summer vacation spent with his family. So we still have a great relationship. But I respect a person that's willing to make that kind of decision um, when they feel like it's right for their family. To your right, Coach, third row. Tyler Shaw with KBTX and College Station. Coach, how do you keep that kind of hungry mentality um, and make sure that the team has that mentality when they're coming off the national championship? Well, you don't change. You don't change. You don't change who you are. You don't change the way you go about things. You know, there's, there's no stone left unturned uh, when you're the leader of the organization. You're trying to always be relevant. You're trying to stay on top of things. You're trying to monitor things. You're looking for a better way to do things. You know, I was very fortunate to work for one of the best in the business at doing it after winning one. And uh, a lot of those same habits we had already created. So the question and narrative is, you just won one, you know, how, how things change. Well, we had five straight years of finishing in the top seven. Those were pretty good years. We had to, we had to come back after those good years. We lost good players those years. Um, so I'm looking at it as we're going to continue to do the same things we do, but how do we refine the process? How do we do the process better this time than we did last time? That's what we're trying to do. To your left, Coach, fourth row. Jacob Goins, ESPN 106.7 in Auburn. The Auburn and Georgia rivalry has become one of the best and always has been one of the best in college football. What do you expect to see from Brian Harson in Auburn in year two and the matchup between you guys on or in week six? A lot of respect for Coach Harson. A lot of respect for Auburn University, and uh, it's a, you know probably where I grew up in Bainbridge was closer to there than anywhere other than maybe Florida State. So got a lot of respect for that rivalry game. It's one of the first games I remember going to as a, a child, being on the sideline and seeing Pat die before the game before they played Georgia. It was it was cool for me growing up, a high school coach's son, because I got to go to both those games, home and away. So respect the rivalry. Uh, expect it to continue that way. Um, and looking forward to an opportunity to play them, uh, obviously, at our place this year. To your right, Coach, second row. Hey, Coach, Ben Bobick, Local 3 in Chattanooga. Last year you said Lad McConkey is the best thing about college football. What did you mean by that, and how have you seen him become a leader in your locker room and how he's been there for a few years? He loves the game. He, like, has this passion for the game, and uh, it's contagious. Uh, he was a kid that, 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 you know, I watched two or three clips of, and then I saw a YouTube video, then I saw him do a combine, and I was like, well, why, does, why are not, not more people recruiting him? Because, what, he's he maybe a little small? I don't know. He's really fast. He timed well. He loves the game. He's tough. Great basketball player. Um, so we went and said, let's do the, 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 the immeasurable thing. Let's, let's see if we can offer him a scholarship to get him to come to Georgia. And... Uh, he took it, and he practices every day as hard as he possibly can. He loves the game. He loves the University of Georgia, and he's what's right about the sport. Because for him to capitalize on NIL and opportunities, it's, it's not really about that for him. It's about winning games for his, for his brothers and fighting for his teammates. And uh, I, I appreciate the way he plays the game. On the aisle, fourth row. Uh, hey, Coach. Michael Giddens, the War Report, Auburn. Can you talk about how challenging it is to have to play a good team twice in one season? And do you feel like uh, maybe the SEC championship game loss provided a blueprint for you uh, to game plan in the national title game against Alabama? 
Well, I think it's it's really hard to play anybody twice, especially the team that uh, won the first game, because just the mental uh, part of you know the human nature is to relax if you think you're better than somebody or you've beaten somebody, and the underdog opponent is always going to have some kind of competitive mental advantage if you allow them to. Um, you know, I think I told somebody we were maybe favored in every game last year. I don't know about the last game, but I know we were favored in almost every game. So psychologically, that can wear on you if you don't prepare the right way mentally. Um, but I don't think having played in that SEC game the first time gave us some blueprint for the second game. I mean, at the end of the day, the biggest difference was our ability to stop people on third down. Because when you don't stop them on third down, you play too many snaps. And uh, we played really well in the red area where we didn't do that well in the previous game. To your right, Coach, third row. Warren, Coach, West Blankenship on three. When it comes to recruiting, is that something that came naturally to you early in your career? Or did you have to learn from other coaches, refine that, and pick that up as, as you kept going uh, further into your career? And if you can remember, how did your first attempt at recruiting a player go? Man. <clears throat> going way back, I, I think you evolve as a recruiter, right? So you, you don't just stay the same. If you stay the same, you get passed by. So it's really cool when you think about all the – I feel like I've been recruiting forever, and I'm 46. So I, my first job, I got cut by the Indianapolis Colts. I was recruiting for Georgia in 1990. Nine, I think it was, maybe 2000. I'm, 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 I'm recruiting there, and I'm relatively young, and I was a different recruiter then than I am now. But my first recruiting story was probably at FSU. It was about a state we had to recruit kids, but it wasn't as high profile. You had to wait and see where kids went. But I was a GA at FSU, and a coach told me one time, he said, you want to be considered for an assistant coach job? You want to be treated like an assistant coach? Dress, act, and recruit like one. And when you're a GA, nobody will treat you like a GA. He said, they'll treat you like an assistant coach if you act, behave, and, and, and present yourself that way in everything you do, whether it's shaving before work, whether it's how you dress. And I thought, okay. So I approached it like I was an assistant coach. And I remember I recruited a kid out of Jacksonville, Florida. Um, I think he played at uh, Mandarin High School with Tony Carter. I started recruiting him. I was allowed to go work camps, so I went and worked a camp he was at. I got to be around him for three or four days. I got a really good relationship with him. I was a graduate assistant at FSU, and I ended up signing him, and he was a top player in the country. And it let me know, it gave me the confidence that, you know what, I can go against these other coaches, even though I'm a graduate assistant. I think I've got a, a good bond with players. I played the position, and um, it, was a, it was my first real recruiting battle and uh, he's still, he's now a coach, so he stays in touch. He comes and visits, and, and he played the NFL for about 10 years. But he's a, he's a great young man, and he's my first recruiting story. Third row, and then pass your microphone one over. Okay. Hey, Coach, Georgia Chambers, WFF 48 in Huntsville. Some players said that the team buy-in from last season set last season apart from others. Is there anything in particular that you credit this to? Yeah, I, I've talked a little bit about it, about the skull sessions and the, the commitment we had to our kind of team DNA. So we spent a lot of time last off season coming off of the COVID season on bonding as a team. Time bonding as a team, we sacrificed a lot of meeting time on football to say, you know what, let's just get in these groups and have these open sessions and, and have these hot mic sessions where you can come in and talk about anything you want to talk about and get to know somebody and. I don't know. The players really bought into it, and they they don't do it unless you do. So we had uh, I don't know what you would call them uh, informational packets each week. They, the coaches had to present this material, almost like a curriculum, like you're teaching a class. And I thought that the coach buy-in made the players buy-in. Therefore, there was this really great connection um, that the players enjoyed being around. They embraced that. They thought that was a weapon, like a like a pass play. We're going to stay on the third row. Hey, Coach. Um, Mary Alex Anders, WSWG. Um, so even after the success Georgia had last year, how do you think that Stetson can grow as a quarterback going into the season? Well, he can be a better leader. He can uh, make more plays with his feet. And uh, I think when you put someone in the role as the quarterback and they're the starter, they immediately get some credibility he probably didn't have that credibility this time last year. He had not been put in that role. He's earned that role. He's earned the right to start. Uh, he's embraced it. He takes that responsibility head on. And he chose to come back, you know, after winning a national championship and said, I want to go do, I want to go do something special. I want to go play football. I want to enjoy the game. I think it's, uh, I think it's just kind of who he is. And the biggest thing he can do for us is make sure that 
He's throwing more touchdowns than he is interceptions. That's what I tell him all the time. Keep that touchdown interception ratio the right way and make plays. He's got a lot of good players around him. To your right, Coach, back row. Hey, Coach Ryan Curley, dog post. Stetson, being the starter, being the guy going into it this season, what are the biggest differences you've seen in his chemistry in the offense and then just him in general with, a, with an offseason where he knows that he's the starter? The biggest difference is his confidence. You know, I, I never questioned his confidence, but the confidence in the players around him is much greater than previously. So it's hard to measure that in terms of numbers or statistics, but I expect him to have a really good year because he's got more players around him that believe in him and they've seen him do it. We have time for two questions right here in the third row and then we're gonna come to the front. Hey Coach Mark, Alice from Strangelo with WSB. Uh, we saw a really cool moment in the hallway between Nolan Smith and head coach Sam Pittman. Uh, they embraced each other. Nolan's like, can I hug you? And they did, and they shared some words. What does it just say about the program, even after coaches move on, that they still have that special relationship with the guys? Well, it's the bond of a coach. You know, I, I felt that way when I left uh, Alabama or left other places to go somewhere, and you see those guys. I still remember, you know, the national championship game we lost seeing Minka, who's a kid I recruited really hard, spent a lot of time with his family, and got to know them so well. And you see him grow and have success, and then all of a sudden you run into him and you're going against him. You know, and it, it, it makes it a special bond, and just that's the kind of person that Sam is, and he commands respect from both sides of the ball. I mean, Sam Pittman didn't coach Nolan Smith. You know, he, he went against him. But there's a bond there, and that's what's special about good people. Final question, front row. Hey, Coach Jacques Doucet from WAFB TV in Baton Rouge. Uh, I know you don't play LSU this year, but just as a prominent head coach in the national championship winning coach last year, what are your thoughts on Brian Kelly joining the league uh, coming from Notre Dame? Yeah, you know, had a chance to go against Brown when he was at Notre Dame uh, two years there at Georgia and respect the job he does. I think he's very thorough, very intelligent. He has a system that he believes in. Um, he does a tremendous job with that. Uh, very thorough. I mean, when we played them in – I was at Alabama, and we played them, Notre Dame, in the national championship down in uh, Miami. I just thought it was incredible watching their season and the way he managed their team. Uh, just from top down – organizational management, I think he's really incredible. You think all the way back to the days, I think it was Grand Valley, when he was at Grand Valley State and I was at Valdosta State, he has won. He has a system that he believes in and that's really more about how you get success. Do you believe in what you do? And he has a great system in that. Thank you, Coach. Appreciate Thank your you. time.